Okay. Let's start. Good morning, everybody, and hello out there. Very warm greetings from Neustadt am Main in uh, Germany, especially in Lower Franconia, which is part of uh, beautiful and wonderful Bavaria. I am really, really glad that you have all come here to NDC 2021 London, which is obviously a virtual event, but still it's one of those great NDC events that I have loved for many, many years. And a virtual hug goes out to all of you attending the conference, attending the workshops, and now also attending the sessions and the talks, especially my talk now. I hope you are all safe, and I hope you will enjoy the next 60 minutes, and I hope you will enjoy the entire conference. This session is about Blazor WebAssembly and gRPC. Uh, I want to talk about the idea and I want to take you on a small journey uh, whether codefirst.net single page application developer um, tooling and the way of developing SPA applications together with .NET may increase productivity for a certain number and a certain way of use cases that we are going to use. Um, the question is why I am here and why I'm actually doing this session. So first I want to put a question mark into the session title because it really, really depends on your experience. It depends on your environment. It depends on your use cases. It depends on a lot of um, various things. So at the end of the session, hopefully we get some kind of picture, some kind of an idea and a map, um, what we can do and how we can do it. And hopefully also why we could do it or why we should do it. And um, I want to kind of shed some light on in, in a pragmatic way um, to decide for you whether the approach of using Blazor WebAssembly on the client side together with the gRPC-based communication and API approach may be something that's worth for you. So I'm Christian from ThinkTecture. And as said, I really, really like the, the entire NDC uh, family and the NDC universe. My first NDC indeed was in 2008 or maybe 2007. I'm not sure about that. Uh, the interesting part is at that NDC, which was taking place in Oslo, um, I was talking about WCF, the Windows Communication Foundation. I was talking about WF, the Windows Workflow Foundation. And I was uh, talking about the ISB, the Internet Service Bus, which then became part of something that um, Microsoft now calls Azure, and which is now um, part of the Azure Service Bus service offering. So I have always been historically some kind of a server guy, some kind of a communication guy, some kind of a, well, yeah, services guy, if you like. Um, but of course, over the years, it has turned out that there is more than just <laughs> the server side. So we really need to talk about end-to-end -end applications. We, we really need to talk about end-to-end -end application architectures. We need to take into account the client side, the server side, in between security, uh, online, offline, database backends, synchronous communication, asynchronous communication, and so on and so forth. You get it. Um, therefore, I have been focusing in the past, well, now it's actually already also 11 years, um, on the end-to-end -end aspects, because in uh, 2000, I started with .NET and C Sharp, focusing on the server-side stuff. And in 2010, I started focusing on the single page application idea inside of the web and inside of the browser, um, using tools like AngularJS 0.9, using um, later versions of Angular, like Angular 2, very early alphas. I can still remember those infamous hotel bar nights with uh, two of my younger 
colleagues trying to get the early bits of Angular running. And of course, still looking around uh, into how could that end-to-end -end application architecture story for the .NET minded and the C sharp loving developer actually be made well, better. How could it be made holistic? How could it be made the yes, that's it kind of way? Um, I think I'm not still there yet, but with this session taking Blazor, WebAssembly, and gRPC on the server side or in between, uh, the story kind of goes full circle now because um, a lot of things remind me of WCF, and a lot of things remind me of how you actually do it in SPAs, and maybe we can get some kind of a story and a journey together so that at the end of uh, the talk, we might see that uh, this is actually a possible and maybe a viable solution for you as a .NET developer. Talking about questions and answers, talking about Q&A, um, let's take that into the Slack channel, okay? Um, if the session is over. Let's just hang out there and do the Q&A thing. Uh, you can also send me emails afterwards, chris.valle at thinktecture.com. If you like it and if you really want to promote the idea that I'm going to discuss here, just uh, ping me on Twitter with, with at chris.valle or otherwise just um, get in touch with me through this, the Thinktecture website. Okay, so the journey today is, of course, the client, of course, the server, and of course, we want to reconsider the way that we are today thinking and breathing and implementing the communication aspects, any communication aspect actually between the client side and the server side. Because now with Blazor WebAssembly, we have a way to use .NET on the server, because we had that all the time, right? With ASP.NET Core, .NET Core background services, with Docker-based um, containers inside Azure, outside Azure, running in the cloud, running on-prem, you choose it. Um, but I want to talk about not the, the open space of public applications that need to have public APIs, so I'm not talking about that uh, thing where you open up a web API, HTTP API, REST API for the entire world and you want to give them access to your data, to your um, business logic, to your workflows. I'm talking about some kind of controlled environment where you own both ends. You own the client side, and you own the client side and you own the server side. And most ideally, you actually can deploy them in parallel or with one shot. So that's what I mean um, by controlled environments. It's that you or your team or your product uh, owns the entire um, universe of the client to the server and obviously also to the backend. And at the end, as said, let's try to think about, is that really great what we have been talking about, what we have seen. Is it really a viable way? And is really everything gold that glitters in this uh, new.NET everywhere world? Because this is what a number, maybe countless.NET developers all over the globe are still dreaming of, as I know, uh, that we can use .NET and C sharp everywhere. Great. So it's essentially three parts, okay? It's what? It's why and it's how. SPAs and APIs, I love those acronyms. TLAs are the best thing in life. We talk about our client applications not running on Windows, not running on mobile devices as native applications. We talk about running our code and our apps inside of a browser. That browser could be standalone like Edge or Chrome or Firefox or Safari or it could be embedded in, inside kind of a native application wrapper or shell with Electron or with WebView 2 or with Ionic and um, the respective 
tooling for mobile application, which is called Capacitor. And of course, we can use those applications entirely standalone inside of our browser, but obviously we need some kind of a point to talk to because we need to get data, we need to talk to a central logic, we need to, to, to share data, we need to post and uh, add new data, we need to change data. So we need a server or we need a, a, a family, a plethora of services running on one or more service. And of course, we need a way for those um, things to communicate, okay? Um, and obviously, this is a very, very common thing. Uh, if I switch to um, Visual Studio, so here I have a Visual Studio solution, which has a ASP.NET Core 5 um, server with Web APIs, we have a Blazor WebAssembly, um, also in .NET 5 client application, and we have a shared um, DLL with some um, shared data. Okay, so what is it all about? Well, in the end of the day, in Blazor, we are talking about SPAs, and I'm all only talking about Blazor WebAssembly. I'm not considering Blazor Server. This has nothing to do with this distributed application architectures if you're using Blazor Server. I'm really talking about real client applications that are capable of being installed locally, potentially running offline, having the full flavor and the full power of the client and the devices they are running on. So it's all Blazor WebAssembly. So this is our anchor and of course, we can talk to our um, remote services running uh, on some kind of server or running serverless, if you like, and they could be implemented in .NET, in um, Go, in Java, whatever you like. And inside of a Blazor WebAssembly client, we could just use HTTP client because we are using .NET here, right? So this is kind of a shift of a mental shift if you guys are coming uh, from a JavaScript based SPA framework like Vue or React or Angular, uh, where you have fetch or an abstracting um, implementation based on the framework on top of that. Here we can just use HTTP client as we are used to. And of course, our application talks to URLs, okay? Uh, if we now um, send that to the browser, um, we get the start page here. And yeah, it's a plain um, Hello World-ish Blazor WebAssembly application, not using um, Bootstrap as a CSS framework, but uh, trying to, to mimic the material design uh, world by using the Mud Blazor um, components. And if we talk to our server here or to the API here, we can see that, of course, um, we are doing HTTP calls and this client is just talking, well, to that service. Well, nothing really spectacular as you might uh, think. When we are talking about those APIs and when we are talking about those services sitting on the server, there are two ways of thinking and two ways of approaching how to, how to cut them and how to design the interface. So one is contract first and the other one is code first. So both are about building boundaries, boundaries into our systems. And I'm all only talking about the client to the service communication. I'm not talking about microservices communication, I'm not talking about um, asynchronous skewing stuff, super duper decoupled, super duper scalable. I'm only talking about the plain old, completely boring client to server, server to client stuff. And if we take a contract first way, this usually takes some kind of an open approach by using open standards by using um, open formats. For, for example, in the WCF world, we used XSD and WSDL. Whereas in the code first, we usually use the programming language at hand and the underlying framework, like in .NET. 
And it's also more formal and a more um, targeted towards um, interoperability and openness, again, versus a pragmatic approach. Okay, so WCF, we could do both. So we could do code first with our attributes, and then there was tooling uh, that let us allow to do the contract first stuff by taking XSD and WSDL and then code generate uh, the C sharp code from it. In our um, today world, in the today SBA world that we are living in, we have web APIs. We don't have WSF anymore. Well, hopefully, <laughs> or most probably, but we have ASP.NET web APIs. And ASP.NET web APIs, they tend to be from the architectural idea to be loosely coupled. So we don't have any kind of coupling through interfaces or similar things on the code level. We have HTTP as an application protocol, not just a transport protocol as in WCF, but an application protocol with semantics. So we are using the URLs, we are using verbs, we're using everything that HTTP gives us. But of course we can design and model our um, interfaces based on data transfer objects. And those data transfer objects could be shared in a simple way um, between, between the client and the server. So if we take a look at that, of course, everybody should know today how to create a web API. Of course, we are talking um, about URLs, we're talking about routes, we're talking about how we can um, get data out of our system via this web API, whether it's a list of data, whether it's single data, whether it's um, updating data, and all the and all the semantics that we actually need to implement could be completely implemented um, by using a uh, by by using a web API. Um, and here in this sample application, I am using DTOs, and those DTOs are being shared between the client and the server already. So um, I can I can use the conference overview here. And I can also use the conference overview uh, inside of my Blazor WebAssembly. Okay, so this is a first step, a simple way in kind of um, lowering the bar for the .NET um, only developer, creating end-to-end -end applications with browser clients and with um, server-side code. The metadata that we're using here is not explicit, it's implicit. I call it the metadata is derived. What does it mean? Well, you can use Swagger or OpenAPI um, in order to, to generate, to reflect on your .NET code in order to let the outside world know um, how that interface is actually looking like. Uh, and then you can go and you can um, create client-side or consuming code for that. If we look at it, let's switch the branch. If we look at that, we will see um, that the new templates in Visual Studio for .NET 5, they automatically enable Swagger code generation or the Swagger generation. And if you are in the debug mode in your development environment, um, it's also adding the UI for it. And um, if you go to create a client, for example, inside of your Blazor WebAssembly client, you could add a service reference. I already did that. And that service reference is pointing to the Swagger JSON file. We have seen that briefly in the first demo. Let me um, start the sample application quickly. Well, quickly sounds like famous last words. Um, okay, so now here we see the swagger of the open API documentation page and we could play around and test um, our API. And I already connected that here. What happens is that we get a reference to the swagger and we also get code generated uh, 
This we can see here. And if we now would look in detail into this code, this is quite clumsy. This is quite ugly. This is not something that I want to use on the client side. Um, let's move here into class view and let's have a look at the methods. Look at that. So it's conferences all async. It's conferences async. It's conferences to async. This is, I don't know what it means. I would now need to go into the into the implementation and see what it actually tries to do. So, so the code generation tries to give us a remote procedure call like semantics on the API, but still behind it, we have a web API, which is maybe not meant as an RPC endpoint. So there is some kind of, um, some kind of an issue um, if you want to talk from your client application to your service as a remote procedure call endpoint, well, then you should have a remote procedure call endpoint on the server side so that you are easily um, able to use it as an RPC client on the client side. So the problem here is that <clears throat> the code generation and the swagger is reflecting over the code on the server side. So in order to make it nice, to make it usable, to make it look like an RPC-like API on the client side, we would need to add more metadata to it. We, need, we would need to use all the Swagger-related um, attributes and items and properties in order to pimp it up, in order to be really, really um, a cool way of doing a remote procedure call um, style of communication. And yes, I know, of course, you can do any kind of APIs with web APIs. You could do fully REST style on any of the four um, abstraction layers of REST. You could do RPC. You could do, I don't know, open. Um, you could do OData. You could do um, GraphQL and so on and so forth. But here with a, a built-in uh, tooling of Visual Studio, it's kind of RPC-like, but only RPC-like and not the way it should actually be. And we still have this round trip, right? If something changes on the server side, yeah, we need to regenerate the client representation, which is not really nice in my eyes. So this is maybe not what we want. What we want is we want to have some lightweight data transfer mechanism. We want to have some a representation on the wire that we could see, that we could read, for example, for debugging, and which is lightweight um, still. So we have JSON. We have JSON with web APIs. Of course, we can transfer binary data. That's all great and fine. Uh, but JSON is the way to express structured um, data. It's structured, but it's schemaless, which means in the first place, there is no schema information tied to a JSON document unless you were using an add-on like JSON schema or like uh, the, well, the specification and, and the standard that they are using inside of OpenAPI. So, of course, yes, we can get there. We can uh, see, um, for example, if we go back to our swagger.json, we can see that, of course, we now have information for our conference details. We see metadata that I have used there, right? Because I use the data annotations from .NET and they are projected into uh, the description of the conference details. And then we have some kind of information and we, we have some kind of metadata and uh, schema. But it somehow feels the wrong way around. It somehow feels like, okay, why do I have to do and to take all those additional extra steps if I am in a controlled environment? I know the server, I know the client, I know the services, I know all the clients, I control them. Should I really do this or should I really have to do this? So, well, maybe not. Uh, so why should we want to have a different way of approaching the end-to-end -end application architectures. Well, one is let's go to metadata first. So let's turn that thing around. 
let's have a way in our controlled scenario where we can have a strongly typed programming interface, strongly typed on the client side. No, sorry, the client is here. Uh, strongly typed on the client side, strongly typed on the server side, which would mean that the developer, if they control the stuff, would have full fidelity end to end. The second one is 99% of all APIs out there that I have seen as a technical consultant over the past 10 plus years, 15 years maybe, are not REST. They are plain RPC. They are just remote procedure call semantics. Um, so that means we are already doing it, but we pretend to do something different, but we do RPC. So the semantics are not clear for the server and the client side, as I um, have shown to you uh, in the demo just a few moments ago. And maybe I want to use and leverage a modern base protocol for that, where I can have something like um, call multiplexing, where I can have something like um, data streaming, like push semantics, um, in addition to the usual one way or request response communication message exchange patterns. And maybe I want to have something that is capable of giving us a binary representation which is optimized in order to exchange data because sometimes maybe JSON is nice because it's readable, but maybe sometimes it's too, too big on the wire. Well, well, if JSON is too big on the wire, of course, you should uh, use uh, GCP encoding or another um, compression mechanism on the server side. Um, or your API is just designed in the wrong way. But if we could even get it smaller, the payload, that would help in a number of scenarios. And maybe we could have one approach, one standard, one technology that gives us both a data transfer format and a way of describing data. Well, and that is what protocol buffers gives us. So protocol buffers, gives us a way um, of um, expressing data, expressing messages and expressing operations on services, as well as a data representation format on the wire. And this is what gRPC is actually using. So how could we do this? Well, the how is actually depending on, of course, who you are, who your team is, who your circumstances, um, are and the requirements are, but I am just giving you some kind of a first glimpse at an idea of how to start with it. So the first thing that I would consider is the service pattern on the client side. The service pattern on the client side means um, move your, your communication code out of your component and out of your Blazor pages, move it into a service. So think about separation of concerns. The page or the components must not know anything about whether it's HTTP, HTTP2, gRPC, um, a mouse in a walking wheel or a pigeon or whatever. Use the functional abstraction that is available inside of .NET and also inside of Blazor uh, by applying dependency injection. Let's have a look at that. So we are going to the branch for the service pattern demo. And let's clean up it a little bit. So close all tabs. All right. So what we are doing now is we're looking at the client side. So the idea is to to have a client-side interface, here I call it iConference Service Client, and it has some methods, and it also has an event. Uh, I'm not um, looking at the initialization stuff because that is um, based on another um, application that is doing a, a little bit more complex stuff with SignalR for initializing the communication um, channels. 
and I'm not talking about the event handler either. So we are going to concentrate on the on the prototypical CRUD-like API on that interface. The interface is now being implemented on the client side, as you can see, just as we would do it uh, in any other kind of .NET application, client application or consuming application. We're using HTTP client. Um, we are, um, yeah, we are just leveraging HTTP client based on the base URL and the API route in order to get our job done. And last but not least, we need to hook it up inside of dependency injection. And inside of dependency injection, it looks like this. So of course we have our HTTP client, which was there before. And now we hook up our um, conference service client implementation. And the usage now inside of our conferences razor page, which is this one here, is no longer HTTP client, but now we are using the functional view onto the use case which is the iConference service cloud. And yeah, we just use it the way we want to get our data, to post our data, um, to update our data, to delete our data, to do whatever we want and we need to do with the client, uh, with the server side. Okay, so that's one first step to get started. It's not really necessary in terms of pragmatism. Of course, you could still have it everything inside of your components, but I think it also makes um, testing a little bit um, easier or much, much easier, to be honest. So the first real step of getting where we want to get is talking about gRPC. So gRPC is a standard and is a way of doing remote procedure calls, as you can see here. So this is uh, the official grpc.io documentation. Um, I tried to keep my slides clear. Um, I have put all those links that I'm showing in the browser um, into the presentation at the end. You will get all the slides. You will get all the demos I'm showing uh, through a GitHub repository. And here we can see that, well, it's actually just gRPC made interoperable and made in a way that we can use it or could use it from each and every kind of platform and programming language on the planet. So there is a base implementation available for c -sharp and .NET and Microsoft added gRPC support uh, for .NET and ASP.NET Core in .NET Core 3.0. And this has been working rather well and has been being um, involved and made better through .NET Core 3.1. And now uh, in .NET 5, the crew has done significant work of making it more stable and uh, especially more performant. So gRPC has been born out of the idea inside of Google of having a low level synchronous way of talking between microservices. Again, I'm not talking about that use case. I'm talking about a completely other one, the client and the services. And of course, this could be one of those set um, microservices, or it could be a kind of a, uh, a proxying service into your microservices architecture. And yeah, there are tutorials uh, on the Microsoft and on the .NET documentation side, uh, which guide you through each of the ne necessary steps in order to do um, a gRPC service. So at the end, a gRPC service as a web API, as a WCF service, as an ASMX web service <laughs> from a former life, they should be kind of facades into our service logic, into our service side logic. A gRPC service at the end is an ASP.NET Core endpoint. And the way the .NET team has chosen to implement gRPC um, in .NET is contract first. That means we need to write protocol buffers. We need to have a way to express the, the shape and the style of our gRPC 
service. How does that look like? Let's reload and let's already rebuild the solution. Here we go. So how does that look like? So with contract first, you have to start with a proto file, a dot proto file. Look at that. I'm not going to explain it in detail. I have done significant amounts of contract first um, things in the early 2000s, basically because of interoperability. That was not for closed and controlled environments. Now, today, and in the past years, and for the, I don't know, upcoming years, I think I will be faced with a lot of controlled environments where the teams control exactly what I have been talking about, at least in the project that we are doing. And in a controlled environment, I, still, it doesn't feel really, really good. It doesn't feel like, oh, yes, of course, we are going to learn a new language. Of course, we are going to do protocol buffers. Because, because, um, maybe not. Look, this looks like a DTO, right? Have a look at the conference overview. Well, this is more or less it. Yeah, look at that. That's an interface and that's a method. Yeah, of course, you could do that if you have to be open, if you have to be interoperable, but I'm not sure. We need, in order to be able to do that, we need to have um, a service on the service side and we need to have NuGet packages in there. You can see that here, um, we have the gRPC tools of the gRPC ASP.NET Core um, package. And this is essentially what we need on the server side. And then we need to implement that interface. And this interface here, this is being derived from the protocol buffers file. So I have specified the c -sharp namespace so that we can better relate. And this is now the base implement, the base, well, the base class is actually not an interface. It's a base class, and that base class needs to be implemented by me. And here I'm using exactly the same approach and the same way I did in the web API. So yes, of course, you should yell at me now and say, hey, Christian, that's not good architecture. Of course, I should wrap or I should take the the actual service implementation, the service logic out and put it into its own class and only have a small uh, facade for gRPC and a small facade for, for a web API. But I didn't, that's left as an exercise to the attendee. If we take a look here, there is quite some things going on. So there is a lot of code being generated based on our protocol buffers file. So still, I'm not sure this is the way we want to go. We need to wire this up. We need to add uh, the gRPC middleware into our startup on the server side. And of course, we need to provide the endpoint that I have mentioned already on the slide to the system in order uh, for the system to know that there now is a conference server. In addition, I have created a gRPC client. And now you might ask, Christian, this is all about Blazor. Why don't you just add it to Blazor? Well, because it doesn't work. You cannot add a gRPC client-side endpoint to Blazor because Blazor runs inside of a browser and the browser has a sandbox and that sandbox does not allow pure and plain gRPC. We get there, we get there. So for demonstration pur purposes, I created a console application. I did, as you can see here, service reference. I added the service reference again, but now not based on open API, but this time based on the gRPC idea. I shared the proto buff file from the server implementation, which you can see here. And 
it is linked into uh, my client project, and then I can go ahead and write code like this. So this is now the feeling that a client-side developer gets and that a client-side developer wants to get when talking to a remote kind of service. But this is still a .NET 5 console application. How can we go and how can we approach now an even further um, idea of moving that into the web? And yes, of course, well, let's try to start that. Can we do that? Let's set start projects. Let's set the API and the console client. And let's start it. So the server should be running. And I'm calling the RPC service. It's not working. Oh, because I'm running on the on the wrong um, configuration. I'm running on the wrong configuration. That means going to the API, moving away from IAS Express because that does not really support gRPC. I'm just um, telling you. Let's try that again. Let's use that one again, and that one again, and let's run it again. So now we should see two console applications, one for the server, yep, and one for the client. So the server and the client. And if I now hit check, these are 306 conferences in my system, which is uh, being uh, yeah, shielded by a gRPC service. Okay, so that works. How could we take that even further? How could we, A, tackle that in a code first way? Because it's still not the way I want it. And how could we uh, take that into the browser so that we can use it in Blazor WebAssembly? So first step, code first. Code first means write everything in C Sharp. Write your interface, write your methods or operations, write your um, data transfer objects, just write everything in .NET on the server side and on the client side as well, so that we can use contract sharing. A, pra a practice or a best practice being used in WCF very successfully. I have spent many years of WCF consulting, explaining people and developers what to not use in WCF <laughs> and what to use in WCF in controlled environments, for example, was to use contract sharing. Channel factory of T, anybody out there? Because that would get us full fidelity again. And we can do that. We can do that by going to the gRPC code first branch. And let's have a look at the startup projects because we don't need that. Okay, so let's clean it up a little bit, close all tabs. What have we changed here? So first we need um, some new Nougat packages. Here we have protobufnet, gRPC, ASP.NET Core. This is an open source community package done by a very, very smart and very, very nice guy, Mark Gravel. Uh, he is really, really deep down with his heart at this very topic of doing the right gRPC things in the .NET world. And he's very active together with a few contributors from the community. And this package is providing us with a contract, I'm sorry, with a code first approach. So what we are going to do is in the shared project, we now have an interface. And this interface is reminiscent of WCF. 
Yes, we are going back full circle, as I have told you at the beginning of the presentation. So service contract means that we need some kind of a marker interface here. And that marker interface is there for the code first library and infrastructure to know what to do. And then we just have our CRUD like service interface with list or conferences, get conference detail and add a new conference. Then, and this is all, right? Of course, our DTOs, they now need to be also recognizable by the infrastructure by using a data contract and by using a data member. I show you or I tell you there is an additional one, which is proto contract. And the proto contract is for more um, advanced scenarios in a number and in a lot of use cases, you could just um, use the data contract. What is very important for a protocol buffers is protocol buffers is based on positions. It's not based on names. So we really need to explicitly specify the order of the properties that we want to use and that we want to transfer for all of our um, DTOs here. And then the implementation is quite straightforward. It's just a plain conference service implementation on a plain interface. And here I completely implemented it with all the three um, methods. And again, of course, yes, you could, you should extract that actual logic into its own class and then just implement a real facade here uh, for the gRPC code first service. And that's really, really nice because that's all we need. Of course, we still have to um, wire it up. We wire it up um, here inside of our startup class by using the add code first gRPC extension method for the middleware. And then regularly we have to add the service endpoint again um, for the new conference service. Just for the sake of completeness, in the server project, I have renamed and refactored the contract first one to conference service contract first, and the code first um, is now just the conference service. So, and this really, really feels like the way, like, okay, this is what we have. We have .NET on the server, and we want to do .NET because we know we will, dot, we will have .NET on the client side. Whether it's a Windows application, you could do that now and use that in your Windows forms, WPF, whatever .NET client, or, and there's still this dream, we could use that in the browser. Oh, we should be able to use that in the browser as well. But now we have the service side. And that really feels good because that's all we need. An interface with DTOs and the implementation and the registration and we're done. Oh, okay. So why did I not start this new gRPC code for a service project? Well, because we don't have a client, because we still are not able to, to, <laughs> to use it in the browser. In order to be able to use and to leverage and to call a gRPC service from a browser, we need an additional technology, and this is called gRPC Web. This is because, as I have already mentioned, because we are running in the browser sandbox. Also, Blazor WebAssembly, well, it's based on WebAssembly because today it's not really WebAssembly, right? Our code is not WebAssembly. This might turn up with .NET 6 when AOT will be part of the game, but today everything is compiled into .NET DLLs. The only WASM part or the only WebAssembly part that is run in the browser is uh, the CLR, and then everything on top is .NET. So we are running in the browser sandbox, our .NET code, on top of the CLR sandbox, but still we are, um, we are guarded by the browser sandbox, which means we can only do what 
um, browsers can do and browsers are not able to fully um, use gRPC based on some HTTP2 internals that are not possible uh, to be used in the browser. This is why gRPC web is there. gRPC web is available, um, I think, since .NET Core 3.1 as an ASP.NET Core middleware. And it allows us to talk from browser clients to any kind of um, gRPC services that we build with .NET through some kind of a proxy middleware, right? So it's actually just one line or two, one plus, N plus um, lines that we need to enable on our server side and then uh, we can so. Let's Seems like uh, Christian is having some technical difficulties. Let's see if we can get him back up and running. Okay, I'm back. Hey, there you are. So I'm Who's back. That? So I'm back, right? You're back. Good to have you back. Awesome. <laughs> so hear me the last thing. What did I say the last thing that you heard, that you understood? We saw okay. the slides um, explaining that you were going to start with gRPC web, and now we see your code. Uh, okay, okay, great. So let's take a look at gRPC web. <laughs> and gRPC web needs to be enabled first by adding a new NuGet package. That NuGet package is gRPC ASP.NET Core web. That's easy. And then we need to enable it uh, inside of our startup CS, which is one line here, the use gRPC web. And the other line is by enabling each and every endpoint that we want to use by adding an enable gRPC web on that endpoint. Okay, and that's it. That's it on the server side. That means now we are able to talk to our gRPC service via gRPC natively, and we are able to talk to it uh, via gRPC web. And how can we now 
marry those two things, those two words. This is done by using the code first approach with the interface that we have built and by using the, the protobuf, uh, the protobuf net um, gRPC code first client library inside of our Blazor client. Yes, that means our Blazor client will get some new NuGet dependencies, which means that our application package will grow. Um, but as a developer, we'll, we will now get that full intelligence feeling and that full fidelity idea that we have been talking about during this session. This is how it works. Going to that final demo, coming back here and cleaning it up again. Okay, so in the client project, what we did is we added a new NuGet package and the new NuGet package is now, well, it's actually a couple. Huh? It's gRPC net client web and it's um, the protobuf net gRPC client factory. And what we need to do is and this is now coming home again to the idea of the service uh, pattern on the client side. We are just creating, based on that interface, we are just creating a new service class on the client. I call them now conference service um, HTTP client and conference service gRPC client. And this is the gRPC client. The gRPC client is only using that functional interface. And yes, we have something that really, really reminds us of um, create channel factory of T from the, w, <coughs> from the WCF world, because not everything in WCF was bad. And then we can just use full intelligence, full fidelity, because we are strongly typed, because we are really, really um, using the code first approach uh, in a browser to services communication by um, applying gRPC and gRPC web with the code first way. In order to register that on the client side, inside of the Blazor WebAssembly application, we um, just have to add this to the service registration for dependency injection. And what we do here is we uh, create a new gRPC web handler which takes uh, the communication, well, mode, this is binary, gRPC web binary, we could also have gRPC web text, and it creates based on the base address of the client application, of the Blazor application, because this is coming from the same server um, as uh, the gRPC service is um, residing at, we can create that channel and return that channel into, into the service collection. And then, as I already showed you at the beginning of the journey, we now go and inject the iConference service client again, because nothing has changed here. We already did that change. And we still call it um, with the list um, conferences async method, because this is now our client-side rep representation of uh, the interface. And through dependency injection, um, we get that um, injected here as the gRPC style of the client. And if we now rebuild the solution and we run it, Dim, 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 dim. We run it. We see the server is being run. This is this one. And then we are going to start the, the client. Let's move it around here. Like this. We're going to the conferences and we're going to inspect this stuff. 
and we are calling it the conferences again. And we can see that now here we have an HTTP2 call, which you can see here, and that is going not to a very web API-ish restish URL. It's just the method on the interface where, that we are going to want to, re, to call remotely. And yes, it's binary. And that's how it works. So now we have full fidelity on the interface, on the data transfer objects. We have a gRPC service on the um, server with .NET 5. It works with .NET uh, 3 and 3.1. And we have a Blazor WebAssembly client running in any kind of browser that supports WebAssembly, which are a really, really a lot today. Um, and we can use the exact same interface, the exact same semantics. We have full intelligence and full fidelity in order to do end-to-end -end communication with gRPC and gRPC web. All right. That actually is it with some hiccup on the internet. Um, this is kind of a personal view of SPA to API communication options when you are in a control scenario. Take it home with you, look at it, make your own decision. Maybe also have a look at Signal R. I think where you have already chosen to use Blazor WebAssembly because WebAssembly, Blazor WebAssembly, has its own issues. Of course, it's still a very, very young framework, a very, very young technology. But for .NET developers that want to have .NET end-to-end, -end, it's surely a viable option to use as a SPA framework on the client side. So if you have already decided to use it, and you know that you are controlling both sides, the client and the server, then gRPC and gRPC web based on the code first approach is a really, really viable way, in my opinion. These are the resources, the links to everything. Here is the link to the sample application with all the branches that you have seen during my um, live demos. If you have questions, please jump into the, the Slack channel that we can do um, a Q&A there. If you have questions afterwards, just ping me, christian.viathinktecture.com. And again, if you liked it, shout it out on Twitter. If you didn't like it, please talk to me personally. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, everybody, for um, listening, for joining, for watching, for bearing with all the things that happened. And enjoy NDC.